It has been quite a while since I did any work on my Regency dress. But as you might know, I actually made this dress for an event. And that event is finally coming up. But in the preparations for that, I realized this is a short sleeve dress and the weather here in the Netherlands might be quite unpredictable. So I think I need a jacket to go over it. So I went back to where I bought the patterns for the dress itself and bought this, another laughing moon pattern. And this time the short Spencer jacket. And let's make it more difficult for myself. I'm going to mix and match the options that are given. What I will be making is pretty much option C with lapels and collar. However, I'm not going to do the fold over collar and just have it stand up straight. And option C is a longer jacket with pleats in the back. I don't want that. So I'm going to take option A and have it short but straight back. This means that there will be some mixing and matching of pattern pieces, but I'll just talk you through that. Then it was on to deciding which fabrics I want to use. I still have the blue left over from the dress itself, but to have a blue jacket over a blue dress would be very blue. So I decided to use this as the lining. I mean, it is a satin of sorts, so it's also very suitable for lining. And then I looked through my own stash of fabric, what else I could match with this. And then I came up with this very bold purple. Yes, it's a very bold color, but I think for Regency that's actually very suited. I mean, the dresses were pretty bold. And I think this purple with this blue makes actually a really nice combination. And another bonus is that I've got plenty of it. So without further ado, let's start crafting this jacket. Size-wise, I ended up on a size 10, so I started tracing that. However, the sizing guide for the sleeves was weird, as they go by length. And considering I have short arms, I'd need a size that would be smaller than given in the pattern. However, the size also determines the width of the armhole at the top, which then wouldn't fit in the bodice. So I decided to just go with a size 10 for the sleeves as well, and just shorten those later. To make sure I know how much to shorten the sleeves, I made a mock-up. This time I used fabric that I had used for a pants mock-up before. It is a nice way to get some use out of previously used mock-up fabric. I made a mock-up of a single sleeve by just single cutting the top and the bottom of the sleeve and stitching them together on both sides. Now that I've sewn the sleeve together, I can check the length. Looking at the picture, I think the sleeve is going to be about this height and it's turned like this. You can already see that the sleeve is quite long, uh, though this will take off one and a half centimeter again because of seam allowance. So let's fold that over a bit. The pattern says that it was fashion at that time to have relatively long sleeves with the cuff ending at the knuckles. So I've got the cuff pattern here already folded over the one and a half seam allowance on both sides. So adding this, you can see that for me, the sleeve is slightly too long. But not as much as I thought for the fact that if I looked at the size of the pattern and the size of the sleeve that I actually cut, I think I cut four sizes bigger than I was supposed to have. So I have no idea why they said that you had to measure the length from under your arm to your knuckles, because that's weird. Again, that also determined the width of the sleeve opening. And I don't think it would have fit if I would have cut size six or eight on a size 10 sleeve opening. Anyway, looking at this, I think I'm going to take off about three or four centimeters. And then we can cut all of the fabric. I decided to shorten it with a full four centimeters. For this, I marked the line at two centimeters on both sides of the length and shorten line. Then I folded the lines and moved the bottom line to the top one. With three layers of paper on top of each other, this means it is shortened by four centimeters in total. This is of course done for both the lining sleeves as well as the fabric sleeves. Then on to cutting. When cutting the shortened sleeve pieces, we gradually cut away from the original pattern to make it align to the folded piece nicely. You could also cut off part of the paper, but that would make the sleeve narrower. And personally, I like my sleeves rather wide as long as the cuff side is still the same width. The pattern gives us that a linen can be used for interfacing, so for this I also used something from my stash. After this, all the notches were cut so that they are easily visible. To make sure I know where all the marks are, I thread traced them. The longer lines of the dart I thread traced with my usual white thread. All the alignment markings I traced with this neon green that I have had laying around for years already. Once you are done tracing, you can pull the pieces apart and cut the threads. 
leaving a nice line or mark on both the fabric pieces. Which we can immediately use, as the first step is to sew on the darts on the front. This pattern gives an option for gathers or for darts. I am going for the darts option as I just love the crisp look of them. After pinning and sewing in both darts, we press the seams to the sides and remove all of the thread tracing again, resulting in a set of neat darts. Then we can start to actually sew some pieces together. The side gets attached to the front, making sure to line up the notches. This pattern has a seam allowance included of 5 eighths of an inch, which translates to approximately 1.6 centimeters. This is a bigger seam allowance than I normally use, but sure. After sewing this together, I cut off the excess seam allowance and zigzag finish the edges. This project is authentic cool, not completely historically accurate, so all seams will be finished like this unless shown otherwise. Then the back piece is attached, first on one, then on the other side. And then we attach the shoulder seam on both sides. After that, we can set aside the bodice and start on the collar. We grab the stamp pieces and attach them together. And this is the moment where I realize that because of the choices I have made, I can actually skip a step. It says here to attach the under collar and the collar stand facing, but because I only want a collar that stands up and not that falls down again, I don't have this piece. So I can skip the step where you attach the two pieces together and I can just immediately attach the stand to the jacket. So let's go and do that. The idea of the collar is that you match the notches and the markings on the collar with the markings on the bodice and sew it between the marks. Do not go past the marks or it causes difficulties in a later step. This seam shouldn't be zigzagged together, so I made notches in the curves, ironed the seams open and then used my pinking shears to cut the seam allowance short. Hopefully it won't fray too much like this. Now we could set this aside again and start on the lining. For this we start by sewing in the front darts in the same way as we did for the outer fabric. After that we can attach the interfacing to the facing by basting them together. This basting has to happen in the seam allowance, but we also don't want it to be too close to the edge. So I penned a 1.2cm distance on my thumb for easy measuring and not continuously needing a ruler. Then the instructions tell me to cut the interfacing close to the stitching. Hmm, another reason I'm not a big fan of included seam allowances. I could have saved fabric by just cutting these smaller in the first place. Oh well, after the interfacing was basted on, we can attach it to the lining front. Here we need to make sure the curve lays smooth, so like I say, when in doubt, use more pins. I think this seam might be slightly prettier if ironed open, but again, I am lazy and this is the inside. So I just cut the seam allowance short, removed the basting from the interfacing and zigzagged it. After which it was ironed to the side which lays flatter, because the fabric is less bulky. The rest of the lining is very comparable to the front. First we attach both sides, after which we can put in the back and connect the two halves. And lastly, sew the shoulder seam together. This completes the lining, which we again set aside for now to again make and attach the collar. For the collar, we first have the same process with the interfacing. Paste it on, then cut it back and treat it as a single piece. The steps after this are the same as for the collar stand on the outside. Sew the pieces together. Here I did make sure to iron the seam to the other side compared to the outside. Then attach it to the neck of the lining in between the boxes. After which we can again use the pinking shears to finish the seam. The collar is ironed away from the bodice with the seams facing downward to make it stand up. Then the bodice lining is placed on top of the outer bodice and they are pinned together all around the outer edge. This next bit seems slightly complicated and I had to read the instructions twice, so instead of just showing I'll tell you guys. I finished pinning the outer layer and the lining together all around, except at the bottom, because eventually I'll turn everything through this hole. But for the collar there is something weird going on. The idea is that I stop stitching right at this mark, then fold everything open again, and then not stitching this seam allowance, and then start stitching again from here. Well, currently it is pinned here so I can't actually access this, but as soon as these pins will be gone I can fold everything open and then start stitching from here. So the idea is that first I stitch both sides, then take it out again, repin the collar and then stitch the collar bit. So let's get on stitching. Ok, 
Okay, this was slightly more annoying to show than I anticipated, but I think I got it now. This means that I only messed up on one side, which is kind of good because that means that I can show you guys what I messed up. So on this side, I tried to stitch it in the way that they appear to be telling me how to stitch it, which is to just sandwich the two layers together and just try and stitch up until the line. But if you've got the color like this, the seam allowance is in the way. So basically, if you really want to stitch up until this line, you will stitch through the seam allowance, which is not what you want. I kind of had to stop like a centimeter before this line, which means that if I would fold it right side out, there's a gap here. And I can't really get rid of this gap, really. So on the other side, I actually did manage to find a way to get this line up until that line. I know it's not too clear with the dark colors, but hopefully you guys can see it. So basically on this side, I fumbled around till I had no seam allowance left on that side. When I put it flat again to actually sew it, I, what I realized that I had done was turn both collars inside so it would lay flat. Basically what I did when you've got the collar is I folded over the seam allowance that would be in the way and pinned it down. I also did it on this side and I actually put in another pin to just put the collar flat against the fabric. With these few extra pins the collars would lay flat back up again and I actually could stitch pretty much all the way up. Maybe I'll have to do one extra stitch by hand to have it fully uh, closed up. So that means on the other side I am going to unpick this and try and stitch it the other way. So basically instead of having the collar fully out, fold the collar in and then fumble around until I've got no seam allowance left on that side. So I'm going to redo this and then we can continue with the next step. Then we can sew the collar itself. The idea is similar. Sew all around the collar edge and stop stitching at the mark, making sure not to stitch over any bits of the seam allowance. To make sure I could stitch it properly, I notched some of the seam allowance so it could be folded out of the way. After that was sewn, it was time to cut off the excess seam allowance all around the jacket, cut off excess seam allowance on the corners, and zigzag all of it. After finishing the collar, we can turn the jacket right side out. For the points, we use something blunt like a pen. Then all of the outer edge is pressed so it lays nice and flat. We roll the seam so the inner layer isn't visible from the outside. This is especially important for the pieces with the blue lining, as the colors do contrast quite a bit. During pressing, I noticed one side of the collar still had a bit of a gap and some seam allowance poking out. So I pushed the seam allowance back in as much as possible. After that, I hand stitched the gap close and snipped off the few remaining seam allowance threads that were still poking out. I don't think anyone will come close enough to see that it still isn't 100% perfect. Then an important bit of ironing. I marked the straight line where the lapel should fold over and iron it along that line. These are the steps where the jacket really starts to look like the final thing. After that, I zigzag finish the edges of the open bottom and we can finish it by folding it inwards and pin them together making sure the lining doesn't peek out over the outer fabric. Then we can stitch this closed with a ladder stitch and then press it. With this, the bodice is done and we can continue on the sleeves. I haven't done lined sleeves often, but the way these will be constructed is extra interesting. We start by adding two rows of gathering stitches to the upper sleeve and a single row to the under sleeve. After that, we can set the sleeves aside and baste the lining and outer fabric together in the armholes, making sure all the seams line up nicely. Then we can start sewing the sleeves together on the side seams. At the top, we make sure not to stitch over the gathering stitches so they can still move freely. They weren't lying when in the instructions it said that setting the sleeves on this jacket was going to be difficult. But to be honest, the instructions aren't really making it easier either. The idea is as follows, we've got the sleeve turned right side out and a jacket turned wrong side out and then we can insert the sleeve and try to attach it like this. First of all we've got the marking at the bottom that needs to line up and then at the front we've got a notch that needs to line up. And that's it, that's all the markings we're going to get. I don't see any instructions about certain seams needing to line up with other seams so I don't think any seams need to line up. Then it says to draw this line slightly to just ease the sleeve in and to draw the double line a lot to have the gathering at the top. But it doesn't say anywhere where either of them has to start and end so I don't know how much gathering is slightly and how much gathering is a lot. 
So what I did for the other sleeve is that first of all, I just pinned between the two marks that we do have. Then I pinned this tiny bit up until the gathering because well, this of course has to lay flush against the sleeve. And then I just guessed something, it fumbled around until it fit. With the gathering string in the under sleeve, I make sure not to create any pleats. I don't know exactly how much it should be pulled in, but I try as little as possible. For the gather top, I measure the gathering length at the other sleeve to make sure it looks even, and then I try to make sure the gathers are evenly divided by using a ton of pins. And when I say a ton of pins, I mean it. Never enough pins, right? Because there aren't many reference points, the most relevant part is that the sleeves look even. So having the seams at about the same height and the gathering starting at roughly the same point. And I think that succeeded. Then for the sewing, the most relevant part is to leave the pins in as long as possible. And even though this isn't the first time sewing gathered sleeves, it keeps being weird. Usually I panic if I feel the fold up here, but right now that is the point, to have folds up here. After sewing we check for evenness, and if there aren't any folds on places there shouldn't be. Unfortunately one appeared at the bottom, but that is a quick fix and soon it was fold free. Then we could remove all the threads and bastings, cut the seam short, notch it, and then zigzag finish it after which it was ironed towards the sleeve. Normally we would be nearly done already, but not for this jacket, as it has fancy lined sleeves. So we continue by attaching all the cuff parts to the sleeve linings. For this, the alignment with the notches is the most important part rather than the sides. And finishing them by ironing the seam towards the sleeve. Then we repeat a few steps from the normal sleeves, by basting in the gathering stitches and attaching the upper to the lower sleeve. If we go by the manual, the next step is to slide the lining sleeve over the outer sleeve, attach it at the cuff, then fold over the edges and sew everything in by hand. Good idea. However, with this fabric, I definitely want to do a seam finishing here because I do not trust this. And it's easier to do a seam finish when this is still a loose piece. So my idea is as follows. I think I'm going to mark one and a half centimeter from the edge with a basting stitch just to mark where the eventual stitch line will be. Then I can cut this back a bit then zigzag finish it as usual and then we can continue like the manual says by sliding it over the cuff. After finishing the edges we can fold the lining towards the insides of the sleeves and press the edges of the cuffs. Pro tip, afterwards also press on the insides for an even nicer finish. This is where we were a day before the event. I might have taken an afternoon off work to actually finish it. After folding the lining inwards, the edges of the lining are folded over and pinned into place. This is a bit easier than the outer sleeves, as we have the seams to line it up as well. Then the remaining fabric is divided between the pins. Again this is a good demonstration of never enough pins. Then it could all be sewn together by hand to make sure you don't see it on the outside. I tried to stitch outside of the sewing machine stitch line as well, so that isn't visible either. Both sleeves took me about 7 anime episodes. Lastly, we need to sew on a closure. For this, I determined where the closure should be by seeing how far the two sides overlap, keeping in mind that I am wearing more layers when I actually wear the dress. Then I determined the placement of the hook and eye closure and sewed this on, trying to get the stitches divided nicely around the eye. After both eyes were sewn on, I also did a few stitches around the hook to make sure it remains flat against the fabric. After this we can determine the placement of the eye and sew this on as well. If you think, but a single hook and eye like this will open easily. This is a specific kind with an extra bar, so it takes a bit more effort to open, making it less likely it will just open randomly. Then a last press and we are done. Friday evening is well in time for an event on Saturday, right? <laughs> 